Previously, I showed how to find the gravitational potential energy function. But in general, for what forces can you create potential energy functions? Well, there's gravity. Yeah, and that's about it. Uh, if you're not from my class, you may have seen a spring force that you could create potential energy function for. But really, at this stage in a general mechanics course, there aren't that many forces for which you can even create potential energy functions. Tension, normal, friction, none of those work. What kind of force is necessary to create a potential energy function? Well, it's called a conservative force, but that word doesn't really mean much at this point, and it's really kind of hard to define. So let's take it, first of all, in one dimension. In one dimension, any time independent force that can be written as a function of position is a force for which you can derive a potential energy function. In one dimension, I can write down the function for gravity and it looks just like this in my one-dimensional vector notation, where here I have a one-dimensional axis that positive is up, the magnitude of the force is the mass times the acceleration due to gravity, and the direction is negative, pointing down. So this is a function of position in that it's constant for any position, but it is at least defined for every position and is therefore a function, and it's independent of time. And under those conditions, we were able to derive a potential energy function. So let's just play with some other model functions of this type that might satisfy this condition. Well, the easiest one to think of beyond just a constant function would be a, a force as proportional to x, proportional to position. So here I have one of those functions. I have a force that as you, get pos as you go along the x-axis, a force that gets larger and larger in the positive x-axis. It's at least defined over all of position, and it's time independent, so we can find a potential energy function for this force. The potential energy function is the negative antiderivative of the force. So the negative antiderivative of alpha times x is just negative one half alpha x squared plus an additive constant. Now to solve that, we have to choose a zero of potential energy. Well, I don't know. I'll just choose the zero of potential energy at zero. That's worked for me before. If I plug that into my expression, I see the x squared becomes zero, and so it just equals c. And thus c, my additive constant, is also zero. So my potential energy function is equal to negative one-half alpha x squared. I don't know if this function make, makes much sense to me, I have this function that has a positive force, and the further you get away from the origin, the larger the force it is. As you get out into space, I don't even know how big it might be. But it might apply to something small within a certain region of space where this is true. I have as a potential energy function, then, would be a negative parabola, something that's zero at zero, and then extends in either direction as an upside-down parabola. Let's look at another force. This type of force may make more sense. Now, I still have a linear force, but the further positive I go, the larger the negative force I get. I am assuming alpha is a positive constant here. And the further negative it goes, the larger the positive force this becomes. This is called a restoring force. It is always providing a force towards x is equal to zero. This is now a very common force. This is the sort of thing that model springs, but also molecules as well as components inside nuclei of atoms. So let's find the potential energy for this function. The negative antiderivative of this function is a positive one-half alpha x squared plus the additive constant. Well, where should the zero be? I'm going to choose my zero of potential energy to be at x is equal to zero. When I do that, then I find that zero plus c is equal to zero, my additive constant goes away again, and my potential energy is just one-half alpha x squared. This is now a regular parabola. Zero at x is equal to zero, and then it, it extends as a positive parabola in either direction. Let's do one more. Here I have a negative linear term, negative ax, and I say a is positive, plus a constant term. 
but it still satisfies my condition. It's not time dependent, and it is defined as a function of position, so I can find the antiderivative as a function of position. The negative antiderivative then is positive one half ax squared, a negative bx, plus the additive constant c. Should I just throw in the zero of potential energy at x is equal to zero again? I don't think so. I'm going to choose the zero of the potential energy to be where the force is equal to zero. Now you may not have noticed, but that's exactly the same condition that we had last time when we were looking at f of x is equal to alpha x and negative alpha x. Sure, we chose the potential to be zero where x is equal to zero, but that was also where the force was equal to zero. So I'm going to follow that pattern and choose the potential energy to be zero where f is equal to zero. So now I need to find that location. So if I put zero in for the force, then I have zero is equal to negative ax plus b, and I can solve for x bring negative ax on the other side, make it positive, and then divide both sides by a, and I get the position x, where f is equal to zero, where the force is equal to zero, is equal to b divided by a. I can now put that into my potential energy, which I have now defined to be zero at this location, and I have one half a, then x squared at this location, b over a squared, minus b times x, substitute in, plus additive constant c is now equal to zero. Multiply that out, I get b squared over a squared, and one of the a's cancels here, so that gives me a one-half b squared over a, and here I have a b squared over a. If I bring those to the other side, then I have a positive b squared over a, minus a one-half b squared over a, which is just a positive one-half b squared over a. I can put that into u of x, and I now have a function for position, one-half ax squared minus bx plus b squared over 2a. Now we could end there, but before we do this, I'm going to show you a really clever trick. I'm going to multiply both of the, those two terms by 2a over 2a. I'm doing that to be able to factor out an a over 2 from every term. If I factor out an a over 2 from the first term, I just have x squared. If I factor out an a over 2 from that term, I'll have 2 times b over a times x, and it's minus. Now if I factor out an a over 2 from this term, the 2's cancel, and I get b squared over a squared. Now I knew this was going to happen. This can be simplified to just be x minus b a quantity squared. So now I have a nice concise result. The potential energy function is one half a times x minus b a quantity squared. Why did I do that? I did that to show the connection between the simple function we had before. Note that this is just a positive parabola centered on zero. But this is also just a simple positive parabola but instead of centered on zero, it's centered at b over a. So adding this constant term to the force didn't really change the shape of the potential energy function, but it just shifted it in amount b over a. That may not seem important now, but that's the sort of trick that will come in handy later, and it's useful to have in mind when dealing with linear functions of this form. Finally, we have the very important inverse relationship. If the potential energy function is the negative antiderivative of the force, then the force is the negative derivative of the potential energy function. And in this direction, we don't have to worry about the additive constant. We can just take the derivative. For example, before we had a potential energy function of 1 half alpha x squared, and we take the derivative and we have the force equal to a negative alpha x. It is worth knowing that the potential energy function is a scalar and the force is a vector, but within the one-dimensional vector notation, and as long as we're working in one dimension, these relationships hold.